So Rabbi Tatz is explaining the idea that when a person finds themselves confounded by a wrong choice, let's call it an immoral choice, or a bad choice, so anybody in their right mind would never make the wrong choice. They want, you want to do, at the, at the source of who we are, we're all good people. We're all pure people, and we all want to make sure that we do what is right. So then how is it possible that if a person has two options in front of them, one is obviously immoral, corrupt, wrong, and the other one is just control yourself and don't do that thing, why would a person ever make the wrong choice? So we spoke about last time this idea called Ruach Shtus, which is this spirit of nonsense or insanity that enters a person at that moment when they have to make a free will choice between what is good and bad and what is right and wrong. And it ends up coming to the point that they kind of lose their bearing at that moment. And it allows them, that momentary lapse of reasoning, it allows them to slip in the choice that they're making and end up choosing the wrong choice. Because again, you don't want to do what's wrong. You want to do what's right. That's the, the neshama wants to do what's right. And that's really the, the, that's really the more powerful force. But we get into situations where either based on our actions, decisions we made previously in the past, whether the, the neshama, the, the muscles aren't uh, bulging as much as they could be in our souls, so it allows the cloudiness to enter in at that point. So he says over a fascinating um, uh, insight, which just with practical illustrations over here, so we can begin to understand what this is. He says you have a person who's a chain smoker, or a person who's addicted to drugs, and they're about to take their next fix. Now, as he's going to take the next fix, let's say, of that particular drug, he might remember at that moment the, the, the disastrous effects of his last failure, meaning he knows that when he shot up last night, he was out of commission and he felt horrible and he felt sick, and they're about to call the, the, the paramedics on him because they thought he's going to die. But at the same time that he's thinking about that, he's thinking about the tremendous high that he had at the moment that the, that the uh, whatever it is goes into his veins, and he gets that initial jolt of the high. So on one hand, he can be thinking about the destructive results that are going to take place if I do this again. On the other hand, he thinks, wow, it felt so good. Before I got sick, everything felt so good. The smoking calms my nerves, even though that I know that it makes me cough and I have a hard time falling asleep at night. But while I'm smoking, it calms my nerves, I feel great, it's good for the digestive tract, everything is good. So a person, uh, and then he says, a person can be faced with an illicit pleasure. He might see the humiliation and destruction that will follow. He knows if he gets caught, if they find out, he's going to be destroyed. At the same time, as he's looking at the world of destruction that he might be creating for himself, he also sees the tremendous ecstasy and pleasure that he's going to have while he's involved in the illicit act. So he's seeing two things at the same time. Someone who's struggling to diet, they might be motivated by the desire for health and well-being, and that's what's driving them to control themselves from eating that piece of chocolate cake. But then they think to themselves, but I know that chocolate, take, take, chocolate cake tastes good, so let me just have a bite right now. And you know, one bite leads to another, next thing you know, the cake is off the plate. So I, I'm supposed to be dieting and taking care of myself, but at the same exact time, I'm experiencing in my memory or my fantasy world the pleasure that I'm going to have from the, from the chocolate itself. So, says, the, says Rav Tatz, in each of these scenarios, the opposing motivations will make their presentations, and they may do so repeatedly. Right? The cake will just keep flashing up in your eyes. Right? The, the high that a person experiences, how does a person become an addict? If they know that it's so bad for them, how do they become an addict? Because the fantasy or the pleasures that they had in the in the high that they got from whatever drug they were on, continues to present itself to the person and telling him, do it again, do it again. You feel so good when you're high. 
it takes you away from the world. It takes you away from your problems. When you get, how does the guy become an alcoholic? Because he keeps convincing himself, when I'm drunk, I'm happy. And that's what the Yetzirah does to them. When you're drunk, when you're drinking, your problems go away. The tension goes away. The stress goes away. You're a much easier person to deal with. Everybody likes you better. So just keep drinking. I, but I know that it's bad for my liver. I know that the morning after I'm hungover. I know sometimes I say not nice things to my wife and she gets upset with me. And then the other voice comes in and says, yeah, but think about you're laughing, you're happy, things are great, you're relaxed. Yeah, but this, this, this. So the two things, are keep, they keep presenting themselves multiple times to the person. Now, the, that phase will manifest as paralysis as both sides offer their fantasies and the mind moves between them. I, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. On one hand, I know that, that heroin is a terrible thing. On the other hand, I know that I, I never feel more alive than when I take that first shot of the heroin. So it's back and forth, back and forth. The person ends up finding themselves in that particular situation. They are in a state of mental paralysis, says Rabbi Tatz. They're not sure what to do. But when a choice is eventually made, one of the options will be allowed into the all or nothing center of consciousness that orders actions. And action will follow. So now, if I choose the wrong thing, that now takes over my brain. I've just been seized by this illicit pleasure that I'm going to have. And then it just uh, it allows me to go forward and do the wrong thing because it now is all that I see and all that I hear and all that I think about. So the voice of reason that was there before, it just, it's gone at that point. Nobody would ever do the wrong thing if while they're doing the wrong thing, there's the voice that is telling them, stop, 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 stop. That means that once you choose the wrong thing, that takes over the conscious uh, area that is there inside of your brain. If the choice is immoral or destructive, it will be preceded by an instant, an instant of blindness, like we said before. So again, you're, you're battling back and forth. Heroin or just be a good person. Smoke the cigarette and, and increase the chances of lung cancer and the like. And the coughing and the, oh, my, my face is getting wrinkled and the hair is turning gray. I just control myself. So when I'm about to take that cigarette or that fix of the drug, so he says it has to be that for that moment before you make the wrong choice, there's this, this ruach shtus, this blindness that sets in, a moment of voluntary detachment from reality, but you're choosing to detach yourself. It's voluntary detachment. Meaning, I can't blame the moment itself that I was blinded, that I made the wrong choice, but rather because you weakened under the pressure, and you couldn't commit yourself to making the right choice, so you're voluntarily then allowing yourself to be blinded at that moment. Because how else could such a choice be made? How, how is it possible? You would make the wrong choice. Nobody wants to make the wrong choice. Everybody wants to make the right choice. So he says that in a moment, in that moment, a few seconds of childish, child, childish pleasure can be allowed to seem greater and perhaps even more sensible than long-term health or life itself indeed. I mean, everybody wants preservation of life. Everybody wants to live long. Like we were talking about before the class started. Everybody would like to live as long as they possibly could. Even the guy that's killing himself with his drugs and his cigarette and his alcohol, he also would like to live as long as he possibly could. So he's trading in a childish pleasure a momentary pleasure, okay, maybe whatever, he's going to get drunk, it'll last for six hours that night, whatever it is. But the next day, the morning after, he's got to deal with the hangover and the headache, and he's got to get to work on time, and he's got to deal with his, he's going to have to deal with his wife and his kids and everything. So he traded in right now for a fleeting pleasure what is really doing the right thing. The choice will be made, the act is done, and then the fantasies uh, and then the fantasies will dissipate in the harsh light of reality, suffused with frustration and shame. When the guy wakes up in the middle of the night and he's lying on his bathroom floor, covered in vomit, and his wife doesn't want to talk to him, 
So he's going to have to deal with that. But at the time, he wasn't, it wasn't clear enough in his head. He didn't think about it enough. Or there's another option. He, he'll, a hold will be maintained on reality. The immoral option will be rejected. And the dangerous opportunity will pass. Meaning, and he writes, even though sometimes the fantasies will linger on in his mind, which will bring about that challenge of free will another time. And the path that is taken is chosen because it's chosen. Which means you find yourself, your two choices, you're pitted one against the other, and you're trying to make the right choice, and it's pushing you in the wrong direction, but you grab hold of yourself and you say, no, I'm not giving in. I'm not giving in to the drugs, I'm not giving in to the cigarette, I'm not giving in to the alcohol, I'm not giving in to the illicit relationship, I'm not giving in to the immoral act, I'm not giving in to the into the crookedness in the business where I could end up getting in trouble with the, with the FBI. I'm not doing it because I want to do what's right. So that means that the stronger that the side of good is inside the person, the more strength and courage that a person has on the inside, the more that he's going to be able to hold himself in place. So I'll just leave off with, okay, maybe, you know what, maybe we'll, we'll leave. He has a fascinating story just about how extreme this could go, and we'll, we'll see that next time. Okay, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome.